Hello, my name is Randy Kojima from Pacific University, and it's my pleasure today to be able to share with you some thoughts about using corneal topography in orthokeratology practice. I'd like to acknowledge Euclid Systems, makers of the Emerald Lens, as well as Medmont Instruments, the maker of the Medmont Topographer, for sponsoring this session. Now, a question we might ask is, how do you arrive at a successful emerald lens fit? What does it take to get to this point where we have a beautiful looking fluorescein pattern and maybe more importantly, an ideal outcome post wear of that lens overnight? Well, one of the things that definitely factors in is the quality of the baseline topography. Remember that your initial emerald lens is built by that corneal topography data. So spend the time taking a good quality baseline map because it determines the way forward. Is that first lens a success? And do you need to make an exchange, a modification in the parameters? So if we can get it right the first time, obviously that's our goal with every patient. And that baseline topography is so important to that first fit success. It determines our candidacy, whether we should be moving forward in orthokeratology lenses. It also determines the initial lens parameters. So very, very important topography. Now, how do we arrive at this successful outcome where we've got this beautiful bullseye? And again, the corneal topography becomes critical to this. Having quality baseline topography determines whether we get a first fit success bullseye and then understanding the post wear outcome also is contingent on getting a quality topography map. So both pre and post fitting capture is important. So don't underestimate the value of both. Now, is this a good candidate for orthokeratology? What would you look at to decide whether this is a patient that should do well in ortho -K? Well, one, we might look at the fact that it's a regular cornea, flat meridian, steep meridian, 90 degrees perpendicular. It looks like a relatively straightforward case, although it is a limbus to limbus corneal astigmatism, suggesting the peripheral cornea may be a little more toric than it would be if the astigmatism were confined to the center. So right off the bat, we know it's a normal cornea, but it's slightly tougher because the peripheral cornea is so toric. If we look at the K readings, we can see that the corneal astigmatism is about two diopters, or for those of you who think in millimeters, 0.4 millimeters of corneal sill. So that's relatively high. That would suggest that it's not the easiest of cases, but certainly doable. We look at the, the eccentricity and on the flat meridian, it's relatively high. And we know that the higher east the eccentricity, the better the response to ortho -K. We can also look at the sagittal differential here, which looks at the tericity at eight millimeters out. And as the map had suggested with this limbus to limbus astigmatism, the peripheral cornea is toric, and this patient has 72 microns of tericity. Typically when the eye is greater than 30 microns of tericity, we require a toric lens, or a toric lens may not be a bad consideration. Now have a look at this situation. We have a patient that has a nice looking fluorescein pattern, possibly a little thin at the edge. The comfort was okay. The vision was pretty acceptable in the AM, but the PM, the vision was quite poor and the patient was experiencing a lot of aberrations. So what should we do to improve the outcome here? You've got a nice looking fluorescein pattern, but what's happening underneath this lens? And this is how topography helps us. It is going to describe how we're actually changing the eye. Vision is, is telling us that we're doing okay in the AM, but why is the vision dropping in the PM? The slit lamp is saying we've got a nice looking fluorescein pattern, but what needs to be adjusted to give this patient quality AM to PM vision? 
Now, in this case, if we look at the topography map, we can see the pre and post fitting subtraction map. In other words, we're comparing before ortho K to after ortho K to understand the difference. And this patient has a smiley face outcome. The treatment zone is riding high in relationship to the black pupil. And that's given us this paracentral steepening inside the pupil. So the patient does very well in the AM, but because of this paracentral steeping inside the pupil in the PM, there's a quick loss of quality of acuity. And as the pupil dilates in darker lighting, we're getting more aberrations from this steepening out here. So understanding the topography post-treatment becomes so important because it tells us what's wrong, it tells us what's right, it tells us how we can optimize the fit when necessary. So the, I can't underestimate the value of the capture process. Don't consider it just taking a photo. It's much more than that. Spend the time getting a quality baseline capture and that will pay its dividends long term in the percentage of first fit success with your Euclid lenses. Now have a look at this case. Is this a quality baseline map? What tells you whether this is a good or bad capture? And if this is before ortho -K treatment, we might look at the central shape of the eye and we're not seeing that normal figure eight astigmatism. There's a flat spot right through the center of this map. That's a bit odd. When we look at the vertical meridian, this white axis line, and the powers distributed across the vertical, there's this big dip in the center. So what's at work here that we are seeing this very abnormal dip in power? And to me, it looks like this patient was just taken out of contact lenses, and we have some flattening across the central cornea or we had uh, some tear film thinning right in the center, so the tear film breakup was relatively quick and it caused this flattening through the middle. I just don't trust this topography. But if we build a contact lens from this map with this belief that the cornea is much flatter, what happens? Well, we end up with a flat fitting lens. The actual cornea must be much steeper than we believed because we had this poor baseline topography, possibly a molded eye that needed to normalize first, possibly a patient that just needed a better image taken of the pre-fitting map. And so when we constructed our initial lens, it ended up being too flat for the eye. We get a smiley face response with the treatment zone riding high, paracentral steepening slightly inside the pupil, probably creating some aberrations and poor PM vision. So you get the idea. It's really important to have a quality capture on the baseline that gets us off in the right direction. Now here's a situation where we have a baseline map with a hole in the center. So did, did this patient come in wearing ortho K lenses? We didn't allow enough time for normalization of this eye or was there tear film breakup and we just got a poor quality map? And then post-treatment, I'm not sure we have a real good quality capture. The, the lid is quite low, causing this possible pushing of steep contour. Is that uh, actual artifact from, from the tear film? But uh, I look at this subtraction map and I really don't know what's going on here. Is this the beginnings of a bullseye? Is it a central island? it's very difficult to say. So having two poor images is giving us a difficult time of understanding the outcome. So take good quality maps. Now this can be tough because when you have deep set eyes um, or f in the case of ortho K, we're fitting it on so many kids with their small fissures, what do we do? Well, one of the things that's helpful is to pull down on the cheek and pull this lower lid down, get it out of the way. We can't pull up on the upper lids because then the patient can't tame, maintain normal tear flow. We can't get smooth and even reflection because the tear film will be drying out. We've got lots of eyelash shadows which are a problem. So what you might do 
is have the patient bring their chin in, forehead back, tilting the face slightly back, and pull down on the cheek, and that's a way you can open up the fissure slightly. Again, we can't pull back the upper lids because the patient needs to maintain normal tear flow. But do the best you can to open up that fissure. When we build our Euclid lenses, we want to know if we need the toric. And it's this vertical meridian we need measurement of in addition to the horizontal or generally flat meridian of the eye. Now here's a case where I've taken a photo and look at the distortion of the rings across this entire uh, surface area here. I don't know if I can trust the map because I've got all this tear film breakup that I'm reflecting off of. How am I going to understand the underlying eye surface? So when you have dry eye, you've got to try to capture when the tear film is smooth. Uh, don't have the patient open their eye up too long. They need to blink regularly. If that's not enough, if you can't have the patient blink quick enough and get an image in between, then instill artificial tear. That might be a way that you can smooth out the tear film. What we're hoping is to capture a placido reflection with the rings looking parallel and even from center to periphery. We're looking for the lids to be out of the way and to minimize these eyelash shadows that you see here as best that you possibly can. Now of course short of cutting the eyelashes off we're not going to completely eliminate the eyelash shadows in many patients but the goal is just to reduce those shadows as much as possible, get the lids off the superior and inferior cornea. And what that does is it creates a topography where you see contours that are smooth and well-rounded. That's normal eye shape. We shouldn't see a hot spot right next to a cold spot. We shouldn't see these contours take radical 90 degree turns. The eye is very smooth, especially when it's normal. So zoom in on these central rings and make sure they appear parallel and even. The topographer constructs the eye from the center to the periphery. So if the center is understood, you have a much better chance of understanding the entire cornea as a mountain. Now here's a capture I've taken on an utterly normal eye with a minus one, minus a quarter axis 65 uh, refraction. But we get this topography that's showing us this very keratoconic like very central like ectasia but this is a normal cornea the slit lamp signs are negative the patient's quality of acuity of high is high why does our topography look so poor if you take multiple maps that proves out whether you're looking at the real eye shape and clearly one of these images is not like the other so this is a rogue reading or a false reading and this can happen when we have an eye that's moving radically at the moment we snap the photo if the tear film is inconsistent or hadn't smoothed itself out with if you've got central scarring or scarring in the the central uh, area of placido reflection and it can just happen when the software burps so take multiple images and that way you can be sure are we looking at the real eye shape do we see reproducible images here we see this with the rule astigmatism very similarly this one's clearly a, a poor reading focus in on that placido reflection zoom in on the rings make sure you're not seeing these tear film breakups where multiple rings are coming together and that's what created this false topography then we get a beautiful reflection with parallel and even ring reflection and we get this uh, normal looking topography so again it goes back to take your time on the baseline map if you look at these four maps that we've taken pre-fit, we see the same topography four times over. So that gives you great confidence that you have the same eye shape. Uh, the topographer is not having any trouble reading it. It's seeing the same eye four times over. Chances are it's accurate. So reproducibility can be a indication of accuracy. 
Now, certainly in the Euclid lens, the radii of the cornea is important. How flat or how steep is the eye? That will determine the parameters of lens you initially choose. So certainly we want to have good readings of the radii of the cornea. What is the flat K? But K readings are an indication of the center, not necessarily of the entire depth of the eye. And this is where eccentricity, shape factor, asphericity um, come into play with um, all contact lenses and the Euclid lenses. So consider these three eyes all have the same central radii of curvature, but they all have very different eccentricity values. 0.2, 0.49, and 0.65. So these eyes might on paper, based on the K reading, need, require the same contact lens, but in actuality, you may need a much deeper lens for that low eccentricity eye. You might need a flatter fitting lens or lower sag, a greater uh, a peripheral curve, flatter peripheral curve system for the high eccentricity cornea. So if you can provide Euclid with the parameters of both the flat K but also the eccentricity, that will help them to best design the correct initial custom. <clears throat> Now another thing that's worth considering is the visible iris diameter. Should we be fitting every patient with a 10-6 lens? And clearly we shouldn't be putting a 10-6 on a 10 millimeter cornea, nor should we putting, be putting a 10-6 on a 13 millimeter eye. So measuring visible iris diameter is one of those simple and easy things you can do with the corneal topographer that gives you a much better starting point in terms of the initial scleral, uh, pardon me, ortho K lens diameter. Now for a Euclid lens to be built, uh, all you need are three very simple things. The RX, obviously, the K readings, the radii of the cornea and the corneal astigmatism, and the visible iris diameter. These three components give the consultants at uh, Euclid the information that they need. We also talked about adding eccentricity as well because this can be a valuable tool. But ultimately, we don't need a lot of information to build an emerald or sapphire lens. Now take a look at these two eyes. They both have very similar corneal astigmatism. About one and a half on the image on the left, about one and a half with the image on the right but very different appearances of their topography. Here we have a nice apical astigmatism. Here we have a limbus to limbus astigmatism. Notice how the hot contours run from one side of the eye to the other. Well, what does that mean to you in terms of your uh, Euclid lenses? Do you need two different products for these eyes or do you need the same? Now let's take the first patient, our apical astigmatism with about one and a half diopters of corneal astigmatism. Let's measure the sagittal depth of the eye. Let's measure the height of the cornea across the flat meridian. Then let's measure the height of the cornea across the steep meridian and calculate the difference. So 1466 uh, relative to 1489 in microns is a difference of 23 microns. In other words, the eye is deeper by 23 microns vertically. So our contact lens will land on the flat meridian and should have 23 microns of fluid at 12 and 6 o'clock on the steep meridian. Let's compare it to our limbus to limbus astigmat. Here we see our flat meridian, our steep meridian, and measure the difference. And this patient has 45 microns of differential. So two very similar eyes. In fact, this eye has more central corneal astigmatism. This eye has less central corneal astigmatism, but this eye has less peripheral astigmatism because it's apical. And this patient with limbus to limbus has much more peripheral corneal sill.
Now, what does that mean to you? Well, when you're dealing with a uh, symmetric GP or a symmetric ortho K lens, when your corneal astigmatism is greater than 30 microns, when your peripheral corneal sagittal depth is greater than 30 microns at an eight millimeter diameter out, that's when you typically benefit from having a toric. So a symmetric lens on less than 30 microns of sagittal differential, a toric lens on greater than 30 microns of differential. In ortho K, what that does is just gives us better alignment out there in the periphery. Now, when we do orthokeratology on apical astigmatism, we can usually squeeze that hot meridian out of the way. In other words, we can squeeze the astigmatism out and leave the patient um, without any refractive sill or with very little. When the patient has limbus to limbus astigmatism, then it's slightly tougher to push that cylinder out of the way. And although we've been able to create a nice bullseye, a well-centered response, you notice that a hot meridian hasn't really been sphericalized. We have not pushed the vertical meridian out of the way. So it's a little tougher on limbus to limbus astigmatism. Another thing that we might consider is, should all ortho K lenses be perfectly centered? Should every one of our Euclid lenses have that beautiful bullseye response? And we might look at this eye and say, well, we have a relatively symmetric eye shape. When we do ortho K, we get this beautiful centered response. So look at the baseline map and this green yellow border. Where is that in relationship with the pupil? If it looks like that circle, that imaginary circle that you've drawn is centered to the pupil, then the chances are it's going to promote a well-centered response. And you get your easy, well-centered bullseye. When the eye is displaced, when the contours are pulled in one direction or the other and not running parallel to the pupil. Notice the green yellow border a couple millimeters away from the pupil here, whereas it's completely off the topography down below. It would suggest that the when the contact lens finds its equilibrium on this peripheral cornea, it's going to be pulled down and out. And sure enough, that's what happens when we fit this patient with a orthokeratology lens. So look at your baseline map. It's going to guide you on where your ortho K lens likely will center. Now, when we build the emerald lens in the Medmont topographer, is there anything special that we might look at that's different from using K readings or any other topographer as an example? And one of the first things that you might do is say, what is the sagittal differential that we talked about? And the Medmont uses a attribute on its main window that can tell you right off the bat, as soon as you look at the principal information, the K readings, the corneal astigmatism, the eccentricity, and what is the sagittal differential out here at eight millimeters. Remember we said an eye that has greater than 30 microns of sagittal differential may benefit from a toric. And this patient has 63 microns, double the threshold. So this is a patient that, although they have very low or moderate corneal astigmatism, probably could use a toric Euclid lens. Now, if we put on the emerald lens, the symmetric Euclid product in the Medmont software on the topography that we've taken, we can model the fit. And here on the flat meridian of the eye, we see this beautiful ortho K pattern, just clearing the central cornea, your reservoir of fluid running 360 degrees around. Then you have your alignment or landing at three o'clock you're landing at nine o'clock and a healthy edge lift, just what we want. So we've got this beautiful emerald fit across the flat meridian on our limbus to limbus astigmat. 
But when we look at the vertical meridian of that patient that had 63 microns of tericity, you notice what's happening along the steeper, deeper meridian of the eye. When we take that white axis line to the vertical, notice all the fluid thickness where your lens should be landing itself down or close to landing itself down. So clearly the emerald, the symmetric Euclid product, may not be the best choice for this very toric peripheral cornea. And that's where you might pull out the sapphire lens. The sapphire has a starting tericity of 30 microns, exactly where the threshold is that would suggest we require a toric. The sapphire is available in increments of 15 micron tericities. So you can go up to 45 microns of sagittal tericity when you're dealing with a 50 or 55 micron tericity eye. If you're up to 60 microns or greater, you can use a 60 micron toric sapphire lens or even higher. So this is incredibly beneficial to you because when you take a, a patient like this that has a acceptable fit horizontally, but a much deeper cornea running vertically, we need a toric landing. And that's where the tericity of the sapphire becomes beneficial for two reasons. One, we get the appropriate alignment. If we have the appropriate alignment, we have the appropriate centration. If we have the appropriate centration, we have the hydraulic forces applied to the eye where we want them to. If the lens is centered and the hydraulic forces are applied where we want them to, the patient is both comfortable and will likely have the kind of visual response that we desire. Now we've talked a lot about the pre-fitting considerations. What about post wear? Are there some things that we should be using the topographer for to help us appreciate the outcome? And for many of us that might be new to using ortho K lenses, understanding nuances in the floor scene pattern might be a challenge. As an example, is this a patient that is sh showing or exhibiting a edge lift that's too thin? Is this a dispensable lens? Is this a patient that has too much tericity for the symmetric lens we've applied on eye? Do we need a more toric lens? Well, when you're not sure if the fluorescine pattern doesn't give you the definitive outcome, don't worry about it. As long as it looks acceptable, the patient is relatively comfortable, dispense the lens and see what happens in the closed eye environment because that's where these lenses work, in the closed eye wear. And when we do ortho K, only four things can happen. We get it right, we get a bullseye. We fit it steep, we get a central island. We fit it flat, we get a smiley face. We fit it marginally tight, we get a frowny face outcome. So the topographies will tell us everything about the, the uh, outcome of our effect, except the slit lamp exam. So that's the one thing that we can't do with our topographers, understand the physiologic response. But otherwise, the topography tells us uh, vision. It tells us the treatment zone position. It tells us the lens position in the closed eye environment. It gives us so much information. The subtractive map is the function you want to learn how to use. Do not just look at the post-treatment map by itself. You want to figure out in your topographer, how do I select the baseline map, then the post-treatment, then click on my subtractive so I can understand, is it bullseye, central island, smiley face, or frowny face? And once you can do that, then the axial map will tell you how much refractive change did you create? What is the treatment zone position? What is the treatment zone size? And in the case of the tangential map, what is the lens position? So there's so many things the subtractive map will tell you. And figure out from your corneal topographer where to do that. In the case of Medmont users, there's numerous YouTube videos that are devoted to various topics like pre-fitting ortho -K analysis and post-fitting ortho -K analysis and using your subtractive maps. How do you do it? Well, simply click on 
you're pre-fitting your your or to baseline topography then click on your post treatment your post wear topography and then your subtractive map that subtractive function brings up the difference how did you change the eye between this visit and this visit and what act what has actually happened to the cornea how has ortho k altered the eye shape so it's an incredibly valuable function so here's our first outcome baseline post treatment axial subtractive map we can click our cursor in the center this patient had a 3.34 diopter refractive change so i don't have to do a refraction the topography is already telling me I see this beautiful blue treatment zone, well centered to the pupil. So I believe that we're off on the right track, that the effect of this lens, the hydraulic forces of this lens are centered to the pupil. You can look at that blue-green border. That's your treatment zone border. Where is it in relationship with the pupil? And you might argue that that blue-green border is closer to the superior pupil, farther away to the inferior pupil. So there's a slight inferior displacement. But then look at the baseline map. See how displaced that baseline topography is. Now we go over to the tangential map. And what you're looking at here is not the blue in the center like we do with the axial. You're looking at the red. Where is this red ring in relationship to the pupil? So again, draw that little circle on that border between, in this case on the tangential, the yellow-red border in relationship to the black pupil. And this is really well centered, but you might argue it's slightly low and that's because the baseline eye is displaced slightly low. So we'd be fighting nature to bring the lens up uh, much. So when we have a bullseye, it means we did everything right. We got the sagittal depth of the lens correct. We got the alignment zone correct. We've got a centered treatment zone and the myopia reduction that we at least some of it that we want you may have additional flattening or additional steepening required at the center um, to target the correct refractive change but a bullseye is the topographical response we are shooting for now the next response that we might see is the central island and this is where the axial map shows us a blue treatment area that's surrounding a central area of steepening. <clears throat> so effectively what's happening is our lens is a ways off the cornea. It's pulling the central epithelium up. Another thing that can cause a central island, and it's a false central island or a false island topography, is when you have some staining in your post-treatment map and that is misinterpreted by the topographer as a steep area. Generally, a central island is a steep fit, and it's usually associated with an inferiorly positioned treatment area. And you can see the, the bottom of the blue is well below the pupil here, a little bit closer up top. So it's looking like we have a slightly low position. Let's switch over to the tangential map, and here's where we really see that inferior displacement. Look at your red ring take that yellow red border and draw a circle around it in relationship with the pupil the black it's definitely riding low so the central island means that we may have excessive sagittal depth the lens might be a mile off the cornea it's not producing the central compression it's producing tension or suction in the center central islands can be caused by tight fitting lenses so if you've got a steep periphery or a lens diameter um, that's inappropriate for the eye then um, that might be something to look at as well so essentially central island is a tight fitting lens now the response that we see with greater frequency than any other any other than a bullseye that is is the smiley face response where we have blue treatment zone decentered on the high side paracentral steepening inside the pupil 
This is your classic smiley face, basically the blue treatment zone riding high. And when you draw your circle around that blue area, you notice how high it is in relationship with the black pupil. Smiley face patients are usually quite happy visually because you create flattening. If we click our cursor on the center, this patient had a diopter almost of, of central flattening. But in the afternoon, they're losing their effect fairly quick. In the evening, this paracentral steepening will probably be causing a fair amount of aberration. So this lens is riding on the high side. We can probably do a little better. Let's pull up the tangential map. And remember, tangential maps tell you where the lens is positioned in the closed eye environment. And you look at this red ring. Where is it in relationship with the pupil? And you notice how high and temporal this red ring is. So we have the classic smiley face here. And the smiley faces are resolved by tightening up the alignment zone if the lens is riding too high. If you have central corneal staining and the lens is in touch with the central cornea, then you may need to raise the sagittal depth or steepen the reverse curve. But don't worry, for the smiley face, central island, and frowny face, you can call up your Euclid consultant and they're going to be able to walk you through the lens modification changes that are required. The last response is the frowny face. And this is where we see the opposite of the smiley. <clears throat> Notice your blue treatment zone riding low in relationship with the pupil. Let's pull up that ring and look at how that blue green border is low in relationship with our black pupil. Then we get the frown or the upside down smile at 12 o'clock. So this is an, an opposite to your smiley face that we looked at earlier, where the smiley face is loose, the frowny face is tight. Then you pull up the tangential map. Um, a tight fitting lenses generally ride low. You look at that red ring, definitely low in relationship with the pupil. Now you might ask, what is the difference between a frowny, frowny face and a central island? A central island produces central steepening a frowny face gives you basically a good bullseye. It's just riding low. So it's not associated with steepening inside the, the center of the treatment area. Normally frowny face patients visually do quite well. But if you have aberrations and it may be due to the decentration of the lens, the way to attempt to resolve it is to loosen up the alignment zone of the lens to allow the lid to pull it up a little bit so it's a little more on center. Also check the diameter and make sure you have an appropriate diameter for that particular visible iris. Now another thing to consider is Ortho K full effect is seven to 10 days. So when you look at your baseline topographies, don't rush to conclusions. What would you call this one night effect? Is it a central island? Is it a smiley face? Is it the beginnings of a bullseye? It's pretty tough to say. We've got a lot of things going on here. I don't see a frowny face, but I certainly see uh, central steepening. It's yellow, red, it's hotter in the center. We see a blue treatment zone that looks like it's reasonably well centered to the pupil, but maybe slightly high with our paracentral steepening inside the pupil. Could be a smiley face, could be a central island, could be the beginnings of a bullseye. Never rush to conclusions. So here's the same patient after a month, and now we see this beautiful bullseye has, um, has resulted from allowing the lens more effect, allowing the lens more time to achieve its outcome. So never rush to conclusions. And this is a mistake that I know I made um, very early on in ortho -K, and I made it an awful lot, where I looked at that one night topography and I panicked and I thought, oh, I'm seeing a smiley face, I better adjust the lens. Or I'm seeing a central island, I better adjust the lens. And all I needed to do was wade out a little bit longer and it would have been a nice bullseye. And I ended up making lens changes that were unwarranted. So just be cognizant that 
if the physiologic response is acceptable, if the vision seems slightly improved, if the patient isn't horribly uncomfortable, then wait for the lens to achieve full effect. Now that doesn't have to be a month, but full effect is seven to 10 days. So go at least a week if you're off on the right track. And that way you'll have a much better idea after you've seen how that lens settles in, after that lens has its opportunity to push the tissue that it wants to. Now in summary, we discussed at great length spending the time on the baseline capture. If you do that, that gives you the best chance of first fit success. So spend all your time on baseline capture. You don't have to spend as much time on the post treatment, but take lots of pre-fitting maps. When your eye shows displacement, don't be surprised if your outcomes are similarly decentered. When you have an apical astigmatism, this is where the emerald lens is a great choice. It's likely to align to enough of the peripheral cornea it's going to center and produce the effect that we want. When you have limbus to limbus astigmatism, this is where you're much more likely to need the sapphire lens, a toric type ortho K lens. Post treatment, learn how to use the subtraction. Do not just use the post treatment map by itself. You're not understanding the full story. When you have a subtractive map, you're understanding what is the refractive change? What is the treatment zone size? What is the treatment zone position? What's the lens position in the closed eye environment? Those things can't all be described by a post treatment map by itself. So learn how to do the subtraction and then it becomes easy to diagnose the outcomes. Is it bullseye? Is it central island? Is it smiley face? Is it frowny face? And if you can email these maps to your Euclid consultant, they can assist you in optimizing the outcomes. So thanks very much for your time. And if you have questions about either the emerald or the sapphire lenses, talk to Euclid Systems. Or your, if you have questions about the Medmont topographer, uh, contact uh, medmont.com or your local distributor. Thank you very much.